Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well okay so um ladies and gents thanks thanks for joining us my name's uh, ali ibrahim i'm a specialist in uh, child and adolescent eating disorders i'm joined by uh, my colleague agnes Aiton, who's a uh, specialist in eating disorders um, in the um, in, in adults, um, we will be talking about eating disorders. And the title that we've chosen for today is "Why We're Even Arguing About um, Whether What We Eat Is Relevant to Eating Disorders." And although that may come across as rather a um, an intuitive and obvious question to be asking, um, the, the reason why we think it's an interesting question is um, because the mainstay of treatments in eating disorders are focused on the psychology. Um, and, um, and, and it's promoted that you know, there are no inherently bad foods. So we'll be discussing that question in a little bit more detail. Um, I'll hand over to Agnes in a bit to be talking a little bit more about the background um, epidemiology, and then I will talk a, li a little bit more about more um, the uh, kind of clinical matters and what exactly we're doing um, in a specialty um, at the moment um, to be um, uh, treating eating disorders and then maybe expanding that to what we can do differently. Um, so uh, Agnes, uh, shall I hand over to you uh, now? All right, thank you very much, Ali. I, so I thought it would be helpful uh, to raise awareness. So um, actually there is a hidden epidemic of eating disorders worldwide. I, so this is a slide from a few years um, uh, ago uh, from the United States, which um, uh, shows that the um, uh, rate of eating disorders have gone up in parallel with the obesity epidemic. At the time, uh, they estimated that there were about 13 million people uh, uh, suffering from binge eating disorders and about 10 million women battling with anorexia and bulimia nervosa. And um, the estimation of men was about one tenth of that. Um, it, however, it is quite striking to think about that about 80% of um, children under 10 years old are afraid of becoming fat, and 42% um, uh, of uh, teenagers are wanting to. Uh, lose weight. And all of that is, of course, massively reinforced by the multi billion dollar diet in industry, which uh, preys on people's insecurities. And um, unfortunately, we are seeing uh, an increased rate of hospitalization in, for eating disorders. So the situation is quite serious. Um, if you look at the UK, um, and it's just digital um, published. Um, uh, comparative data between 2007 and 2019 using the SCOF questionnaire, which is a screening questionnaire. This is a very recent study, it was published in December 2020. And what you can see on the slide, the darker um, a bars um, a are um, 
representing uh, the more recent day, 2019, that there is um, a, a high rate of disordered eating um, in both genders and across the age range. So this challenges the idea that eating disorders only affect young women um, a, a, and um, in fact, what the data show that um, uh, there's been a really large um, uh, increase in disorder eating um, among men. Uh, and um, that also affects people in mid middle age and, and older ages. Uh, the same study also showed that um, uh, actually uh, people uh, who are reporting a higher rate of eating disorders are uh, among people who are obese or morbidly obese. So again, that kind of challenges the stereotype that this is uh, just um, young um, uh, and thin women who suffer from eating disorders. Um, and what we are seeing um, from international data that um, there is a parallel increase um, of um, eating disorders uh, over the last 20 uh, years or so, um, following the same pattern as the uh, obesity epidemic. So this is a study uh, from uh, Australia when they looked at uh, the uh, prevalence of obesity and comorbid eating disorders um, between, 2000, uh, between uh, uh, 1995 and 2015. And um, as you can see, and obesity rates have um, gone up um, almost doubled. And, and during that time, there's been a significant increase of binge eating, uh, obesity and binge eating, and also obesity and, and strict dieting. Um, as we know, um, diabetes also follows a similar pattern, um, um, has been increasing um, uh, since um, the obesity epidemic, although uh, what we are seeing, the, the link between type one and type two diabetes and eating disorders is slightly different. So type one diabetes usually um, starts in, in uh, children and adolescents and uh, what the large uh, Danish National Registry study found uh, that um, a girls um, with type 1 diabetes have doubled the risk of developing an eating disorders by once boys have almost four times the risk compared to their age match control. And, and the highest incident rate is um, in uh, late adolescence, early adulthood, about five years um, after the diagnosis. And this is um, a, a, a consistent with a Canadian study which found that about uh, one third of females uh, with type one diabetes had an eating disorder by age of 22. And often uh, they had a chronic and relapsing and, and the very dangerous course. Uh, type two diabetes um, obviously affects um, people uh, later in life. And there is an interesting bi-directional link. Uh, so a systematic study found that people who have bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder have about three times um, the, the risk of developing type two diabetes later in life. And then people who have anorexia, on the other hand, have a reduced risk of developing type two diabetes. Um, furthermore, people who have already um, have uh, type two diabetes have a higher rate of, of binge eating or disorder eating, and it's quite often after insulin therapy starts. So if I hand over to Ali. Um, yeah, thanks. So I guess, you know, now that we've established that it affects a wide demographic and it's also applicable to people with, you know, obesity, diabetes and so on, it's the next logical kind of point of inquiry as well, how are we defining what an eating disorder is? And, you know, we have um, several types of eating disorders and several definitions. And I guess the, the, the point that I want to make by with this slide is that, you know, they're, they're, they're rather subjective in terms of the criteria that we have um, for eating disorders, we don't have any kind of immeasurable biomarkers to confirm the presence of an eating disorder. Um, and, and there are several features which are sometimes overlapping. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, Agnes. Um, so, so I guess, you know, the, the point of this slide is to say that, well, you know, there are, 
the, the main diagnostic entities are anorexia nervosa, you know, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, um, ARFID. The interesting thing about those diagnoses is that, you know, we've acquired diagnostic entities over time as um, the food environment around us has changed, which is, which is interesting. Um, but then I guess there are more um, similarities than differences between the different diagnostic entities. And that makes, you know, the distinction between them rather arbitrary. Um, but the main similarities are that, you know, almost every patient that's presenting with an eating disorder is presenting with a distortion of their body um, image, their body weight and shape, uh, attempts, you know, a fear of fatness, an attempt to um, drive their body weight down, which is done by a preoccupation with their diet and wanting to control that. Um, and essentially restricting their diet, which is what causes a lot of the issues in, in eating disorders uh, across the diagnostic spectrum. Um, and then binge eating affects some, but not others, but there is a lot of overlap in the various um, diagnostic entities. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, Agnes. Yeah, so I guess the, the, the point of this is to say that there's, you know, screening is so important because early intervention is really important, so like early identification, um, and, and, and I guess one of the issues that we do need to be aware of is that a lot of professionals feel maybe anxious at times about asking patients um, uh, kind of um, overtly about some of the, um, the potential for the presence of some eating disorder symptoms. Uh, it's actually perce perceived normally by patients as uh, often a, a sense of relief that they're being um, asked about those features. So asking directly about whether you know, patients are having those preoccupations with their body weight and shape, whether that's causing them to restrict or, you know, binge and purge, um, or, or indeed misusing insulin or, or, or other drugs is, is, um, is, is actually really important. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, so, so I guess I thought it, was, it would be really important for us to give an insight into, you know, realistically what most um, interventions um, uh, for um, eating disorders are actually doing. Um, and as I said uh, earlier, um, the, the, the mainstay of treatment is um, psychology. What does that look like? Um, well, there's regular sessions, often, you know, this is psychological support, but then there's in-session in weighing. Um, patients are often given a, a meal plan, um, and that meal plan is um, sold, as it were, to patients as a prescription that they must abide by in order to, you know, address their eating disorder. Um, and, um, and then the meal plan promotes the idea of regular eating in order to reverse some of the um, symptoms. Um, and regular eating looks like, you know, six, uh, five or six episodes of eating the day, three main meals, and that's punctuated by snacks throughout the day. Um, and then there are kind of interventions, so-called psychoeducation at the beginning, so when, when we're assessing and throughout. Um, so those are the kind of interventions that we have at our disposal. So if we move on to the next slide. So I guess the, the meal and it being um, utilized and framed as a prescription is really an important notion. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, this is kind of a typical example of what might be given in um, uh, services, um, especially ones that um, uh, treat adolescents and children with eating disorders. And as you can see, there's a heavy emphasis on starch based foods, you know, um, uh, sugars and carbohydrates. Um, so, 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 I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how many people are aware of, you know, what's been the important part of this is that, you know, this is what is um, given for uh, the, the majority of patients, regardless of kind of, you know, individuality and background. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, and again, this is just to give an example of, um, the, the, the slide is intended to give an example of the type of foods that are suggested for um, snacks. I mean, the, the issue with this is, um, as, as everybody will notice, they're, they're all ultra processed foods. Um, so again, there's, there's no consideration given um, as to whether those ultra processed foods are impacting um, the eating disorder in any way. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, again, so what, you know, what, is, is there any evidence behind what we're using um, in terms of the meal plans that are suggested as prescriptions for, you know, these patients? Well, 
you know, we have um, the, the national guidelines, dietary guidelines, and the Eat Well Pay is, you know, the, the, the thing that's striking about it is the similarities, I guess, between the eating disorder behaviours um, that patients tend to present with, you know, particularly calorie counting, restricting dietary fat and protein, you know, the heavy emphasis on carbohydrates, the heavy emphasis on fruits and vegetables, um, an attempt to include limited amounts of snacks and chocolates. They're trying to control that. Again, disregards whether they have a, um, a potential implications, uh, implication as to you know, satiety and hunger mechanisms, um, uh, but then promoting, controlling the amount that one is having, um, especially where there's a propensity to binge can, can come across as, um, or can, can indeed be harmful. Now, of course, in terms of, so that's in terms of um, the, the vulnerability to developing an eating disorder, and that can be the unintended harm of these dietary guidelines that don't take into account vulnerabilities of patients with eating disorders. But, but I guess the other aspects of this is that really those guidelines being utilized and superimposed um, onto the meal plans that are being suggested uh, really disregards the malnutrition that the, these patients are experiencing and the, the need for increasing amounts of protein and fat to, uh, to ameliorate that. So if we move on to the next slide, Agnes. Um, so this is just to give you a little bit of an example as to what happens in psychology. Um, so there are various psychological models. This is an example of what happens in CBTE, so cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders. Um, so, so, so the way it's explained to patients um, is that, you know, there's a, a kind of a, 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 an over-evaluation of one's body weight and shape um, is normally how it starts. Um, and that leads to a restriction in one's um, uh, uh, di dietary intake um, and, uh, and then uh, potentially uh, binging in some patients and then compensatory behaviours, which includes, you know, um, purging, for example, or using laxatives um, uh, or um, diuretics or other means of um, weight control. And um, others obviously don't binge, but then they go through that um, cycle of preoccupation with their body weight and shape, restricting the diet as a result. And then the significantly low body weight is impacting in, in terms of, you know, further fueling their cognitive preoccupation with their body weight and shape and the dietary restriction. And, and, and so goes the cycle. Now, obviously with both patient groups, there's the interaction of um, the external environment, you know, moods, um, events, um, and, and, and changes in their environment that would contribute to that. So that, that's um, what, what's kind of um, in broad terms, um, the understanding of um, the CBTE model. So if we move on to the next slide, Agnes. Um, so, so I guess the part that's missing from that psychological model is the, the biological understanding. And we know that there's an intimate relationship between you know, the brain and the gut. Um, we know that there are you know, anatomical, physiological, biochemical um, relationships. The, the gut is linked to the brain through the vagus nerves. There are um, multiple um, hormonal signals um, that regulate appetite. Um, and, and again, this is just, I guess, we're starting to scratch the surface, surface really of biology when it comes to how it's related to appetite regulation and eating. But it's so important that's taken into account. And at the moment, there isn't kind of consideration if we were especially kind of referencing the previous slide of, you know, the majority of um, how we understand and how we discuss eating disorders with patients is focused predominantly on um, the, the, the psychology. So if we move on to the next slide, Agnes. So, so the point of this slide really is to say, well, you know, if, if the food that we're um, utilizing um, and, and promoting through dietary guidelines um, and indeed in, you know, meal plans that patients are being given, uh, there's a heavy emphasis on uh, ultra processed foods, um, then, then that kind of um, uh, is, is gonna be a, a little bit of a problem in terms of the implications it has in terms of the biological mechanisms and the influence it has on um, multiple hormonal signals, including insulin. Um, and as we've come to realize that, you know, um, exposure to insulin for long periods of time and hyperinsulinemia leads to, 
um, blunted responses and, um, and insulin resistance, but also impacts appetite. So the idea of this is to, you know, we, we now have um, a, a slightly kind of better understanding maybe of the current food environment um, as is informed through the NOVA classification um, by um, Carlos Monterio and, and, and his group. And the way that they explain how we can better understand our food environment is, um, is split into four essentially groups. So uh, group one, two, uh, through to four, um, and then foods that are in group one are, you know, un unprocessed food. So it's kind of, you know, normal um, foods that, are, that haven't been subjected to um, processing. Um, so, you know, meats and eggs and, you know, uh, so, so on. And then group two are kind of um, processed culinary type products that um, may be added to group one and that produces a group three processed foods. And then, um, uh, group four are those ultra processed foods that have multiple ingredients added to them. Um, and, um, and, and the intention really is to make hyper palatable, you know, foods with a long shelf life, but then what the cost that we're paying is multiple ingredients being um, added, added into these foods to the extent where those foods become kind of unrecognizable. Um, and, and, and I guess due consideration hasn't been given to the implications that might have on um, uh, society and appetite um, and hunger regulation and uh, the, the biological implications of all of that, especially as, um, uh, as, as is relevant to uh, a group of patients that are having difficulty with appetite regulation and, um, uh, and a group of patients that are struggling with eating disorders. So if we move on to the next slide, Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess the, the, the point really to be made about this is that, you know, there's a, there's a heavy industry influence and, you know, it's really quite sad to see that the target being, you know, children, uh, obviously we see this in clinical practice, um, and it is really quite harmful, you know, we don't understand the underlying biology when it comes to all the, the additional kind of ingredients that have been added to these foods, um, and as we see an increase in eating disorder presentations, particularly in children, um, it is really concerning that, you, you know, those kind of um, adverts and the way that marketing is, um, is, is kind of targeting um, the, the younger age group in children. So if we move on to the next slide. Yeah, I mean, the, the animal models are really important in, in, in saying, well, you know, it's consistent um, so the NOVA 4 foods are consistent um, and their effects uh, are consistent across both, you know, um, um, uh, humans and animals. And it's, you know, the, we can't really turn around and say, well, you know, the, the, the multiple studies that are coming out, you know, obviously rats aren't having a you know, psychological disturbance that can be explained through an eating disorder. They're, they're, you know, it's, so it, it gives us kind of further information that there are metabolic consequences um, and appetite um, consequences um, that would um, uh, that, that are relevant to NOVA 4 um, foods. So if we move on to the next slide, Agnes. Yeah, so the point, of, uh, the point of this is to, I guess, if we look to what we're doing, you know, with a broad lens um, in terms of um, eating disorder interventions, you know, one can think of um, the, um, the three phases um, of intervention, um, regardless of the mo uh, specific modality of treatment that, that's being um, provided. Uh, and so, you know, if we look at what, what we're doing in, in those three phases, so the phase of assessment, the treatment, um, and then post-treatment relapse prevention, um, there's, there's an underemphasis of the biology, um, except for the complications at the point of assessment and, and perhaps treatment, um, but there's um, a, 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 you know, an emphasis on the psychology and uh, social impairment and functional impairment. And, and I think we're doing that part pretty well. So it's, it, it comes as no surprise then that the outcomes um, in, in broad terms, again, consistently uh, studies show that it's you know, half or um, two thirds of patients that get better. And we don't have that much information about long-term outcomes. Certainly what we know is that the relapse rates are quite high. Um, and so perhaps there's an important part of the picture that's missing, you know, if we're addressing two thirds of the problem and, you know, excluding the biology, 
um, then it's no surprise that the outcomes uh, are, are less than adequate. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Yeah, so I guess, um, you know, there's uh, there, what, what can be done. So this slide we saw earlier and, um, you know, we spoke about the, uh, the CBT being psychologically focused. Um, and I guess the, the point of this is to say that, you know, the part that we're missing um, is, is, is that. And so, you know, uh, myself and Agnes try to superimpose the biology um, on top of a pre-existing model that actually works pretty well but here's what can be done differently. So if we, if, if we kind of include the understanding that there's a predominance in the, you know, in the food environment that patients are surrounded by of ultra processed foods, no, but four type foods. And, um, and, and we're talking about, you know, 75% of foods being ultra processed. then of course that's gonna have multiple implications um, biologically in terms of, you know, hormone regulation, that's, that's gonna impact you know, um, appetite regulation and the propensity to be gaining weight and a sense of loss um, of control over one's um, appetite um, and weight gain. And then uh, it's no wonder that patients then describe a fear of gaining weight, a fear of being you know, fat and then attempts at dietary restriction, which is um, the, the, the stem of, I guess, the psychology. So that's where it all starts. But then the biological part that's missing is, well, you know, there's hunger that's driving this. And um, what, what we're suggesting is that there's potentially two pathways that are happening here. You know, there are patients that are um, more insulin sensitive, that are able to sustain hunger for longer periods of time, um, that then become um, ketotic. And that, you know, the emphasis here is that, you know, it's not nutritional ketosis, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, kind of malnutrition ketosis that's then uh, leads to an anxiolytic effect and that drives the behavior. Patients often describe feeling, you know, a, um, an alleviation of um, anxiety, um, but then that causes them to remain in that kind of ongoing cycle of a behavior um, because it, it, it increases the likelihood where they're gonna be kind of, again, preoccupied with wanting to restrict diet, preoccupied with their body weight and shape and a fair of weight gain. Um, and, and an exit from a ketotic state can actually increase anxiety. Now, on the other hand, there are those that are uh, more insulin resistant um, and being exposed to the, 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 the food environment, of course, then leads to giving in to um, hunger. So it, the, the common, I guess, the, the common kind of symptoms that, the symptoms that they're having is that there's an attempt to restrict their diet um, with, with those potentially that are punctuating that um, restriction with periods of binging, they perhaps are more insulin resistant. Um, and then I guess that's further, further evidence by the fact that they're engaging in, you know, uh, no four foods particularly um, with binge episodes. Um, and then again, that, you know, that doesn't help in terms of the weight fluctuations, um, the hormonal implications of um, the, um, the, the various um, um, kind of mechanisms involved as a, as a result of indulging in, 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 in those four foods. Um, and, and of course, the, the, the other factors that might be implicated, including um, an increase in stress hormones as a result of all of that, then increases, you know, feeds into that fear of weight gain and the anxiety, which further drives the behavior of, you know, um, dietary restriction and attempt to control weight, and then further kind of, you know, um, that is dissatisfaction with having, you know, failed again, attempts to try and control weight, um, but, the, but perhaps the wrong foods are being um, advocated. Now, the, 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 the issue here is that it's not just limited to appetite regulation. There's another mechanism, of course, when we're talking about the more kind of um, frontal um, areas of the brain and how uh, one might appraise the healthfulness of food. And of course, that's where the, um, the industry are tapping into the information uh, or the, um, the, the misinformation that's being promoted. And that's further being kind of consolidated by dietary guidelines promoting um, uh, the, uh, the, the consumption of um, foods that, that, that might be harmful. Um, and that interplay between appetite regulation and 
you know, the more conscious, um, you know, valuation of um, the healthfulness of food is, um, is, is, uh, is, is spoken about by um, Diana Small and her uh, group, healthfully by what they kind of proposed as a two-stage model. Um, so, so, so we'll move on from that slide, um, Agnes. Um, and then it's thinking about, well, how can we use this knowledge um, to think about, well, what can we do differently um, to help patients with eating disorders um, in, in an environment that's, um, that's surrounded by, as we said, you know, 75% plus of foods are ultra processed. So one, you know, one option would be to say that, you know, there is, um, that there is potential benefits and there are um, no harms from limiting ultra processed foods. Um, and there's potential benefits from including um, greater amounts of fat and protein in one's diet. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the low carbohydrate, high fat um, option for, um, for patients with eating disorders really shouldn't be excluded as being uh, an option for, for, for this patient population, uh, particularly since we're talking about um, a patient population that is suffering with malnutrition and addressing that kind of directly is really, really very important. Um, and then, as we know, that there are um, the, you know, the, the hormonal influences, I guess, front and center of the hormones is um, insulin um, and the blood sugar rep, um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, changes um, and stabilization is really important and intimately related to appetite regulation. And so utilization of modern technologies like continuous glucose monitoring can actually be really powerful in that regards. Um, and so I, I guess the, 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 the final component of that that does need to be borne in mind is that it does need to be individualized. So what are we likely to find in terms of, um, you know, outcomes if we, you know, uh, pushed forward with an individualized approach, the individualized approach that takes into account the dietary factors? Um, well, the, the first, I think, advantage of this is that, you know, we're, we're addressing the underlying problem. Um, in, in, so, so there is uh, misinformation that's been promoted that's led to a fear of fat and, um, and that's led to a restriction in, 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 in the diet and the, in, in a way that's become unhelpful that's led to malnutrition. That malnutrition may manifest itself in patients being either underweight, normal weight or overweight. Um, but, but addressing that directly, the fear of the, the fatness is potentially a, has a therapeutic element to it. So I think there's an advantage of that. Um, the other thing is, you know, the more that you promote um, satiety mechanisms by um, talking about higher levels of protein and fat, the, the less the risk of binging. And we know that there's a high degree of um, migration between um, uh, eating disorder um, kind of um, subcategories. So anorexia, for example, nervosa, um, uh, patients uh, over a period of time do have a risk to binge or convert into developing bul bulimia or binge eating disorder, for example. Um, so addressing um, addressing the risk of binging uh, is 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 a really kind of important benefit of um, promoting um, uh, potentially low carbohydrate and high uh, fat approaches. And and then there's the the problem that we often find, which is at the point of refeeding this central um, uh, weight accumulation, which uh, compounds the issue that, you know, we're talking about a set of patients that have issues um, and significant um, anxiety around their body weight and shape. And that really isn't helped by, um, especially at the beginning when their, um, the refeeding program encourages high carbohydrate intake, um, which, uh, which leads to high insulin. And obviously uh, that, that is um, that's part of what may lead to the central kind of um, weight accumulation and uh, directly addressing that can be of therapeutic benefit. Um, ketosis, as we know, there's a, a large um, overlay um, of psychiatric kind of issues. And so keep being um, in, in ketosis can be advantageous in that regard in terms of alleviating, alleviating anxiety. Um, and then finally, we're promoting, you know, long-term health and long-term kind of metabolic health. And that's so important in terms of, you know, the, the overall health um, as um, patients emerge out of um, an eating disorder. Um, 
So Agnes, can we move on from that? So, okay, so um, I, I guess I hope that's kind of given a little bit more um, insight into eating disorders and, and, and maybe how we can start thinking about eating disorders uh, differently. Um, thank you very much um, for your attention. Thank you, thank you, and um, uh, we are happy to answer any questions if we can. Thank you. Thank you.